Recently, there was a bit of a commotion surrounding Zimbra, the Zimbra software and technology, when news articles, headlines, and reports were coming out surrounding a Zimbra vulnerability that was actively being exploited in zero-day attacks in the wild, and I thought maybe this video would be kind of cool to go explore that. Go take a look, go see what it's about, and show you the process to validate or do a little bit of research on a known vulnerability. So this is a bleeping computer article that I found caught wind of, and it says Zimbra urges admins to manually fix zero day exploited in attacks. I thought this would be kind of the focus of the video and this is that Zimbra software and technology that we can kind of zoom in on. It asked administrators to manually fix a vulnerability that's actively exploiting the Zimbra collaboration suite, specifically that software and those email servers. Looks like there is a potential big impact here, 200,000 businesses across 140 companies and they dig down into it, but ultimately it is cross-site scripting. It's reflected cross-site scripting, which means I don't know, maybe limited impact. I don't know how much threat or risk is really there, but it's pretty cool to dig into and might be kind of just a fun exercise. Uh, they note that this researcher of the Google tag or the Google threat analysis group was chatting about this and they shared on Twitter, Clem1 and that username that Maddie Soner's hyping up. They discovered this being used in the wild in a targeting attack and Zimbra has released a report kind of noting this. In fact, uh, let me see if they include the link here. Yeah, the company warned on Thursday by an advisor that doesn't inform the customers that the bug is actually being exploited in the wild, but at least the tweets and a little bit more detail in the story does. Now, this is interesting because it does not yet have a CVE assigned to it, and I don't know if it will. Uh, they're noting that, look, the issue has been fixed, and you can see it like in GitHub code and repositories and commits here, um, and they explain expect to release this in July. Uh, it's currently July 22nd. Maybe the release is already out. Maybe it is just something that I'm not tracking, but it's interesting because they showcase exactly what needs to be done to manually fix this. While you might not receive the patch just yet, hey, all you need to do is go open up this file inside the software, go to this line number, and then change what was this text to now this text. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Um, does not require a restart. It doesn't need to be bounced, and we can just kind of roll with it and do it. Now, okay, uh, we can drill down into this. We can spin it up, but that is setting the stage and getting the context here. Uh, the article talks about how previously there were uh, other authentication bypasses in Z the Zimbra software way back in June of last year, had some impact with that, breached over a thousand servers. There was some RCE, remote code execution some time ago, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, let's get to it. So ultimately, we want to be able to test this. So we need a copy of the Zimbra collaboration suite, and we need to get a copy of the software. So uh, we have this tweet that's kind of telling us a little bit more about it, uh, giving us some more detail as to who these researchers were, but ultimately, we need to go to Zimbra's website. And this is it. I just Googled like Zimbra and I go to Zimbra.com and here we are. Now, this is where we could kind of consider this like a challenge prompt in our Capture the Flag. Let's see if they give us a download, right? We can go into downloads and then you could see, hey, these are the files that you could download if you're participating and kind of considering this like a CTF or a Capture the Flag challenge. Looks like we can get a free trial for the Zimbra collaboration software and that is all that we really need. Hey, we could cruise through this. We could go ahead and grab a license with a seven day online trial. Very, very grateful when this is provided by a lot of vendors because that way we can join the fight to do some security assessments uh, and you could just click through these, blah, blah, blah. This will require an email, however, so it's worth noting maybe you could set this up with sort of the plus modifier and a lot of your email and that's A-OK. -okay. You could receive the license and then be good to go once you submit. However, it is the download section that really has what we want. If we click into that, we could see everything that we need and we could download different general availability releases like version 10.0.0. If you scroll down, there are actually a couple are some others and you could move back in past archives, 9.0.0. And what we were looking at was 8.8.15. That is what they referenced inside of the tweet and that's reported on in the news. Looks like that is the vulnerable version. So we could go ahead and try to download that. Let me go ahead and get it for Ubuntu. Ubuntu 2004 LTS. So let's click that 64-bit download and fire it up. Okay, now that that is downloaded, we can go ahead and fire up a virtual machine where we would be able to play with this. Let's go ahead and install it on a box, and I will use an Ubuntu 2004 LTS template that I have created. Let me click in on that and just make a clone of it. We can go ahead and say, uh, yep, that's fine with the tools and field. Let's create a link clone, and we'll call it like Zimbra 
uh, ZCS, right? The collaboration suite, and we're good. Now that that's been created, I do want to create a snapshot of just a fresh clone for posterity's sake, and then we can power this thing on. Here we go. And actually, before we go too far, let me tell you about something super duper cool. There is a free educational workshop coming up. It is a Capture the Flag 101, and it's all about some of the security research, going to find vulnerabilities, going to dig into them, see what they look like, how you could be created, and how you could take advantage of them, and how you can fix them, ultimately, so you don't have these issues in your own code. And special thanks, huge kudos and shout out and support to Sneak for sponsoring this video and hosting that free CTF 101 workshop. Capture the flag. It's one of, if not the best way to get hands-on experience and build cybersecurity skills. You learn all about vulnerabilities, exploits, secure coding, and all of the many aspects of cybersecurity. And that's why Sneak is hosting their next Capture the Flag 101 workshop. If you're looking to get started with CTFs or just bolster your skills, jump into their free workshop on August 3rd at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The Sneak team will walk you through how to solve different binary exploitation and web security challenges, and then you'll tackle some challenges on your own, all with live support from the Sneak team. Plus, if you're a member of ISC Squared, you'll receive one credit for attending the workshop. You can learn different hacking techniques or learn the ropes of Capture the Flag, and it's all interactive. You can ask questions and reach out for help all along the way. Jump into Sneak's CTF 101 workshop. You can register with my link below in the video description jh.live slash ctf101. Huge thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this video. Okay, now that we have our Ubuntu virtual machine fired up, we could go ahead and drag in that simple uh, ZCS installer so we can get it onto the box. And then let's go extract this thing. It's fine to just do that with uh, our simple GUI version here. We can keep it easy. Let me see if we can open this and then extract it into the current directory. That's just fine. Perfect, now let's go ahead and open up a command prompt. I'll hit Control-Alt-T on my keyboard. Let me full screen this with F11 and I'll move into the ZCS directory that we have just created. Now we have an install.sh and a readme. We could probably take a look at that readme first to just see what it is that we're doing. Looks like if we are installing from the binary, uh, we'll extract it just as we've done. We'll go ahead and move into the directory as we've done, and then we just run install. Uh, so is that it? Is that all that we need to do? Let's run install.sh. Run as root. Okay, good enough. sudo stash install. Uh, we'll need the password. We can enter that and then we cruise through stuff. Okay, it asks, do I agree with the licensing agreement? I'll go ahead and hit yes. Uh, and I will zoom out just a bit because my face is probably going to be in the way for some of this. Do I agree with the software license agreement? Yes, I totally do. Uh, installation cannot proceed. Please fix your etc. host file to contain the IP fully qualified host name in the host name, where IP is the IP address of this host, FQHN is the fully qualified host name, and HN optional is the host name only portion. Um, what? Pseudo nano. Whoa, whoa, I can type. It's split up in the middle and it's freaking me out. So localhost, uh, and then let's just put Ubuntu on that same line, correct? Can we do that? Or do we, we, we probably need our actual IP address, right? Let's get back into nano and let's put our Ubuntu. Does that work? Are you cool with that? Now let's pseudo install. Will that work? Okay, now it looks like it's doing stuff. Now it looks like it is pulling things down. So let's let it go and wait until we run into another error. <laughs> yep, install everything that you need to. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, looks like it's pulling everything down. Okay, it looks like it has finished installing things and I just tell it like, hey, install literally everything. I just want the default experience, what would naturally come with the software. Um, uh, we don't need to change the domain name. And now we're in a configuration menu, it looks like. And there are things that we need to set. The unset things that are marked with a bunch of stars are everything that we need here. So we need to set an admin password. That should be under the Zimbra store. Uh, so seven is the number for that. We can enter that number seven. And then we'll set the admin password four, right? So let's just set that to a Dumbo stupid password. That should be fine. And now we need to add the license file name. Okay, we'll enter the option 25 to specify the uh, license file name. I put that in my home directory as ZCS license.xml. Should be good. Now we can press R for the previous menu. Configuration is complete. Okay, we can press A to apply. So let's enter A. Save configuration to a file. Yes, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. System will be modified. Let's do it. 
Okay, it's been like 15 minutes, but it looks like it is finally done. And cool, we are back at our prompt, and I'm assuming everything is good. I think we are up and running. So let's open up our web browser. Let's just open Firefox, and let's see if we are serving anything right now on localhost. Okay, it looks like we are. HTTPS is brought to me with a self-signed certificate. That is A-OK. -okay. Let's accept the risk and continue. And uh, I think, I hope, we're going to be brought to Zimbra. And here we are. Okay, so the username, I assume, is just admin, right? That's what it asked for when it asked for an admin password for us to set. And we could go ahead and log in. There is a separate version here that are being set up. Default, advanced, standard, mobile, and touch. Uh, let's go ahead and sign in. And let's see if it loads here for me. Okay, server's license is not activated. That's weird. That's fine. Uh, okay, I don't care. Um, okay. Okay, <laughs> now we're in Zimbra, right? Email server uh, has been created for us and it took ungodly long time to install because it's a full-blown email server, right? So I'm assuming what we saw in our previous digging and research that we were doing when we took a look at their advisory, they state that is the version that we're up against. The issue has been fixed, but what you can do is you can take a look at the file of Zimbra Jetty Web Apps, Zimbra M Mo Move To. So it was moved to like trying to move an email into a different mailbox folder or something. Um, I don't exactly know, but I want to see, is this a location that is served? It's under web apps, under Zimbra. Um, is it just specifying that's the place to go to? Let's see if we can go to M Mo move to, uh, in just our instance. Let me bring that over to the other screen here and let's go into our URL bar and let's just try to see if we can go to, that was nothing that I wanted, uh, M slash Mo move to. Move to, and then there's a cancel page. So I, I think we're on a page, right? Yeah, this looks like a page. Is this M for like mobile? Is this, okay, okay. Let's try and log out. Let's try and sign out and let's see, can I m log in on mobile? Zimbra, oh, sorry, username should be admin and then password. Will this bring us in to a mobile version? Is that kind of what that MO is supposed to be a prefix for? Yeah, okay, seemingly. So this is, uh, I assume, just a awfully rendered version. Can I, can I send this to admin at Ubuntu Zimbra? Uh, hello, subject can be test. Let's send that, sending request, good. Um, and nothing is in my inbox, but if I see any of the contacts, no, nothing there. Folders, calendars, briefcases, trash. I don't think we really need to specifically find a link or a way to get to that page if we know that we can still at least go to it. That localhost slash M prefix though does tell me that we are likely in the mobile rendition. Oh, okay, cool. So now we can work with things in inbox or sent. Um, is that the page? Well, we, we have it installed now, so we can just straight up go to that location, right? They say it's in opt. Let's go to opt and Zimbra. And then we wanted, what is it? Jetty, web apps, uh, Zimbra, and that location. And now that M directory, I see it right here. We can move into that and we have the move to or MO move to file. Let's go take a look at that. And this is what it should be. Let's set the syntax to like HTML, I suppose. That should be able to read okay, but I'm assuming this is um, JSP or the Java like servlet pages and some of its templating language and everything that we kind of have staged and set up for Zimbra. But uh, I'm assuming again, taking a look at this code, we have data that is provided by the user and it is meant to be escaped, right? So what would be line 40 when they could pass in a parameter, param st, the other things that they've done, they've tried to escape other special parameters. Uh, in this case, they forgot or they didn't. And that's why it's described here, update the parameter value to be what it is here, where you are using that templating language to escape XML, the parameter. But because it's just placed raw within the HTML, that opens the door for XSS or cross-site scripting where we can inject our own HTML. So we could 
test that. We could validate that. I'm assuming param is just going to be like a get parameter, right? So could I super duper simply go back here and then try to pass in param? Well, we know that is our param. st can equal hello. And that's not rendered, right? But because we are inside of a single quote or double quote here, let's see if this is even just populated in the page and we can see if we can break out of those quotes. Like inside the text of the string. Check it out. Here is our value hello present. But now if I go back and I try to add a double quote here and a closing like HTML element that uh, greater than symbol, let's try to add just an H1 or a hello tag. And now that's rendered. That's displayed out on the screen. And obviously viewing the HTML here, we've broken out of that value because the parameter is being put in place. And now we could do whatever we want. Now we can just straight up do HTML, XSS, JavaScript if we needed to. Now here's where I'm wondering though, uh, what is the impact here? Like how can this really be weaponized? Like sure, yes, you can put in some like image source and try to trigger some JavaScript if you have like an on error. And then yeah, you can just do like an alert XSS and then that should fire and there it is. There's our cross-site scripting but because it's reflected then it's not extremely useful unless this link is like sent to someone but then it's visible in the parameters and I don't know how this I, I'm curious what is the other intel on how this is being abused. I got to admit hey we popped our cross-site scripting proof of concept and I don't think I'm going to do anything further to like weaponize this. It is worth noting though that you wouldn't be able to even reach this endpoint go to that URL without logging in like without credentials without authentication it would not allow you to do that uh, and i tried to chat and kind of dig into this i'm assuming that you would need to be authenticated to be able to use that functionality if even you're on, you're on mobile or not um but with that hey you know we kind of could take a look through other files within that mobile functionality and clem that individual that had kind of uncovered this does say yes you do need to be authenticated so again it sort of limits the blast radius and it's cross-site scripting it's got to be client side it's not remote code execution and I don't know how else it could be chained but I'm curious about some of those in the wild attacks. If I may though this is like a, a, a silly Dumbo whoopsies embarrassment blemish on that code right because like hey that simple line just needed to be changed to this one simple function call to properly escape and handle and sanitize input and parameters that are passed in and trusted by the user like that's what you are taught for preventing cross-site scripting and I think maybe this one just fell through the cracks whoopsies uh, no shame on that, like totally understood it's A-OK, -okay. everyone has those moments, um, but it's another one of those that you just kind of scratch in your head like, man, 2023? <laughs> but hey, that is it. Pretty simple, pretty streamlined because the security advisory gave us all the info that we needed to know. Like, hey, go look at this file, go look at this line, change this to whatever, and that is how the vulnerability surfaces and we can go validate it and assess it and see it ourselves. And honestly, maybe Sneak could track that down. Maybe any of the other code security analysis things we'll be able to go find that before the problem reared its ugly head. And honestly, from the security research point of view, like it's fun to treat it like a capture the flag. Like you've got a challenge prompt. You've got a challenge binary file to download. You've got things that might clue you in and that is just kind of neat. If you're interested in that sort of thing, if you're loving, hey, secure coding or capture the flag, take a look at Sneak's CTF 101 workshop link in the video description. And hey, huge shout out. Thank you to Sneak for sponsoring this video and always supporting the channel. Hope you had fun with this one. I thought it was kind of neat, but I'll see you in the next video. Like, comment, subscribe. You know all the YouTube algorithm things. Thanks so much, everyone. See you in the next video.